Can you give me one or two examples of recent um, campaigns or success stories? Having uh, the concept and then designing and delivering the hub has been a success. And obviously having a few people give us awards is very lovely and it's a recognition for that. Uh, I think the greater success is having that knowledge, but having it applied. So hearing from people that are using the knowledge they find on there, engaging uh, in communities of practice, sharing their experience and then applying it for improvement. That's that that is the, the main impact. The fact that we can actually support people deliver change and improvement. That's fantastic. Uh, a couple of examples that may be of, of interest. I think I, if I choose two, and if I choose one that is staff related and one that is uh, patient related, uh, the staff related one is a fabulous idea that came from, um, uh, I, I shall name her, Claire Cox, a patient safety manager at, at King's Healthcare. And when she was working uh, in a, a previous organization at Guy's and St. Thomas's, herself and a couple of other colleagues they created a network of people working in patient safety. They wanted to engage with others to share their experiences, to ask for help, to invite experts in, to create a community of interest, community of practice. And in the year that we've been supporting them through the hub and through various other means, um, they've grown to be over 620 members. There's a weekly drop-in. Um, last week's meeting had over 140. 40 people there. Sometimes it's a network, just the members. Sometimes we bring in experts. And it really, the idea for who comes into those meetings comes from that group. On the patient side and patient campaigning side, um, we uh, use the hub to share knowledge about risk, but also good services. And one of the, some of the groups that we work with are campaigning groups that may be charity. Some of them may be very small Facebook groups. And one of the groups that we have been working with is, is to bring um, a better understanding of the risk of outpatient hysteroscopy and the pain, uh, significant amounts of pain that over 20% of women that receive outpatient hysteroscopy that they experience. And, and that level of pain is uh, uh, quite shocking. Um, the services that are pri provided by some organizations do not meet Royal College guidelines. And what the patient groups have been doing is sharing their experience, telling those stories, becoming more visible, more vocal. And we use the hub to help capture those stories and those experiences so people can use that to inform, engage and influence. And since we set up those um, pages that people can share their testimonies and there are hundreds of women's personal experiences on there, um, we've had those pages viewed over 99,000 times now from around the globe. And we are getting feedback that people are pleased that they're able to source what good practice looks like and they can make sure in their own care um, that they are getting the services that they should be. Those are interesting examples. Now, one item on the Patient Safety Learning Hub website related to a scheme to do with second victims. Can you explain what that's all about? Second victim is a is a term that was first coined many years ago by a, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Albert Wu in, in the States. And I think he even he now says maybe that's not the best phrase to use because second victim was reflective of what happens to staff if they're involved in a safety incident. And I think there's a recognition now that maybe people that are affected by unsafe care and harm, the patients, actually it's their family members and their, their colleagues and friends that are also affected. But what he was doing was highlighting uh, a, an inadequacy, I think, in recognizing how traumatizing being involved in unsafe care can be for staff members. You're working, you, you know, you're professional, you're committed, you're dedicated. And as we know, most error and harm is systemic in its cause. It's not necessarily attributable to an individual and their professional practice, though it may be, but it may be a whole system 
um, a whole sequence of, of errors that have led to harm. Uh, and uh, people that have been involved in serious safety incidents, you know, have been so traumatized. Some people will never work again. Some people carry the guilt with them for years. There was one very senior consultant who I was speaking to, and he shared with me um, a little, a little um, note that he had in his in his pocket, his inside pocket of his jacket. And he pulled that out to me and said, this is the name of all the patients who I've severely harmed or have died under my care. And I, I never want to forget them, but I never want to forget how I failed them so that I continue to improve. Now, that man's guilt and that man's pain is clearly affecting, affected him in a positive way uh, to want to strive for improvement, but a really quite painful way psychologically of the impact. So what we've been doing um, with many experts in this field is bringing together really what, what is good practice? How should staff be supported at the time where there may be an incident that is very severe? How are people um, comforted? How are people helped to get home safely? You know, that they're not put into a car and driving on a motorway when they've had something really traumatic happen. So in the very immediate aftermath, but when, when there is uh, undoubtedly the necessity for a review or an inquiry, they're being treated with courtesy, with dignity, with support. They're not being vilified, they're not being blamed, they are being encouraged to give of their, their opinion of what went on, but that insight informs understanding of the causal factors. And so uh, the idea being that staff are encouraged to contribute to any understanding, but they're supported in terms of their own personal uh, and psychological health and well-being. Mm -hmm.